Well, good morning. What a joy to be with you in Memphis on this beautiful, beautiful May day. If you have your Bible with you this morning, I want to invite your attention to the gospel according to Mark. Gospel according to Mark, chapter 7. And we're going to begin in verse 1 and read through verse 23. Would you stand with me, please, in honor of the reading of the Word of God? And hear the Word of the Lord. The Pharisees and some of the scribes gathered around him, when they had come from Jerusalem and had seen that some of his disciples were eating their bread with impure hands, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they carefully wash their hands, thus observing the traditions of the elders. And when they had come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they cleanse themselves, and there are many other things which they have received in order to observe, such as the washing of cups and pitchers and copper pots. The Pharisees and the scribes ask him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat their bread with impure hands? And he, being Jesus, said to them, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men, neglecting the commandment of God you hold to the tradition of men." He was also saying to them, you are experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and he who speaks evil of father or mother is to be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father or his mother, whatever I have that would help you is Corban, that is to say, given to God, you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or his mother, thus invalidating the word of God by your tradition, which you have handed down, and you do many things such as that. After he called the crowd to, again, to him again, he began saying to them, listen to me, all of you, and understand there is nothing outside the man which can defile him if it goes into him, but the things which proceed out of the man are what defile the man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. When he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples questioned him about the parable, and he said to them, are you so lacking in understanding also? Do you, do you not understand that whatever goes into the man from outside cannot defile him because it does not go into his heart but into his stomach and is eliminated? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he was saying, that which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed the evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murderers, uh, adulteries. Deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness, all these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. Pray with me, would you? Father, as we open your word this morning, it is with a desire that you would speak to us, your spirit would move in our midst, and we would not only sense your presence, Lord, but we would have ears to hear what you would say to us, your people. And that having ears to hear, Lord, we would have wills that are surrendered to obey. And now we pray that this time would be given to you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Up to this point in Mark's gospel, Jesus has been going around teaching and preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And he's been performing miracles and casting out demons. And the crowds are astonished because Jesus is preaching with authority. And he's doing things and saying things that are absolutely unlike anything they've ever seen or ever heard. And the, the crowds are beginning to recognize that Jesus, there's something different about him. There's something special about him. They begin to think that he's a prophet. And the, the religious leaders of the day are a little bit concerned about this. And as the curtain rises on our text, we find Jesus being confronted by some of these religious leaders. Like modern-day reporters ever trying to ensnare the politician, these scribes and Pharisees were verbal hit men, you might say. They were, they were there to ask him gotcha questions. They were going to catch him, and they were going to kind of bring him down because they didn't like the fame that he was getting with the people, with the common folk. And the setting is in the north of Israel in the region of Galilee. It's here that these religious hitmen have been sent all the way from Jerusalem to try to get the best of Jesus. The flow of the text is as follows, verses 1 through 5, we see on this occasion they find fault with him in the fact that his disciples had not gone through the ceremonial rituals of washing their hands before they ate. They, were more, they weren't concerned with germs, mind you. They weren't concerned with passing germs or actually having clean hands. They were concerned that the disciples had not 
venerated the traditions of the elders. It wasn't the Word of God that the disciples were, were not obeying. It was the tradition of the elders. But Jesus will have none of this. In verses 6 through 13, we find his response. And, and lest you have some idea that Jesus is always walking around patting little kids on, uh, kids on the head and carrying sheep, you know, we see lots of pictures of, that like G, of Jesus like that. Jesus calls these people out. He starts by saying, you hypocrites. Now, I, obviously, he didn't read Dale Carnegie's book on how to win friends, you know. Because Jesus is telling it like it is. What I love about Jesus is he doesn't tell us what we want to hear. He tells us what we need to hear. And that is what is happening right here. And in so doing, he exposes the superficial nature of the outward religion of humanity for what it is. He even cites an example of how through their tradition, they have invalidated or negated the power, the force of the Word of God. The, the, the law given by Moses had said that you are to honor your father and your mother and, and you were to take care of them in their old age. But, but many of these scribes and Pharisees, when their parents would come to them and say, I need help, they would say, oh, I'm so sorry. Everything that I have has been dedicated to God, and I can't help you. And so Jesus uses this as an example of how the scribes and the Pharisees with their traditions had undermined the very Word of God itself. The word translated invalidate in the original language here means to deprive something of its power, and that's what they were doing. They were taking away from the power of the Word of God. This kind of sounds like what the Bible says in the New Testament, that, that many will have a form of godliness, but they will deny the power thereof. And it's from this position of believing their traditions were more important than the Word of God. They attack Jesus. They accuse him of not revering the tradition of the elders. But we need to be careful when we be begin to diagnose the great physician because he understands what we don't understand. And it's never going to go well for you and me if we diagnose God. We need to let him diagnose us. As always, Jesus cuts past the superficiality of their human rituals and religion and gets to the heart of the matter. And here's the heart of the matter. The heart of the matter is that with God, the heart always matters. The heart of the matter is that with God, the heart always matters. And that's the heart of our text this morning. There are two things I want you to see, two overarching truths that we cannot afford to miss. And then I want to suggest four observations with a view towards application after we look at these two overarching truths. The first is this. Jesus points out to us the superficial nature of man's religions. For generations, the Jews had been in possession of the Word of God. After the Exodus, God tells Moses to take the people to Sinai, and there at the foot of Sinai, the people stand and the covenant is ratified. Moses goes on the mountain, and you know he gets the law, and he gives it to the people, and the people are like, oh, we don't want to talk to God. You talk to God for us. And, and, and God's intention was that the, the, the people of Israel would take the light of the truth of God's Word and be a light unto the nations and would demonstrate the goodness and the glory of God to all the world. But they didn't want to do that. They had turned it into something that was convoluted and compromised. They had taken the very simple truth of God's Word and turned it into that which was burdensome and cumbersome and difficult, in fact, impossible to keep. One has but to read Matthew 23 to be reminded of how stridently Jesus rebukes the Pharisees for what they've done to the Word. He calls them blind hypocrites. He says they are dead man's bones with whitened sepulchers on the outside, but they're dead on the inside. I mean, this is not going to get him any friends, all right? He, Jesus is not preaching for a return engagement. Remember, God gave the law not only to reveal his holiness, but in light of his holiness to reveal to us our sinfulness. That's what Romans says in chapter 3, verse 20. It says the law comes to give us the knowledge of sin. But instead of owning that sin and recognizing that only God is holy and then in, 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 in recognizing that he is holy, seeing that we are sinful, the scribes and the Pharisees over the years had come up with ways to declare themselves holy. 
Well, if we just jump through these hoops and we keep all these rules and regulations, then we're holy. And it became a competition of who could be the holiest, who could keep all the rules and the regulations the best. And instead of comparing ourselves to God, we began to compare ourselves against one another. And folks, let me just tell you, if you, want to, if you want to convince yourself that you're good, just start comparing yourself to somebody else. You can always find somebody else you think is sorrier than you. For the record, most of the world's religions are works-based religions. I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with people about the gospel. And I've asked them those diagnostic questions. You know, if you were to stand before God and you were to say, why? And he were to say, why should I let you into my heaven? Almost invariably, they will say, because I've tried to be good. Well, I'm better than this person or better than that person. You say, well, you know, if we had this scale here and, and Mother Teresa's up here and Hitler's down here, where would you be? And, and, and I promise you, almost all of them are right up there with Mother Teresa. It's because we convince ourselves that we are not sinners. But Jesus exposes the false religion of humanity for what it is, and he cuts to the core problem, and that's the second observation here, and that is the spiritual nature of man's problems. In verses 14 and 15, this is what Jesus says. After he'd called the crowds to him again, he began telling them, listen to me, all of you, and understand there's nothing outside the man which can defile him if it goes in him, but things which proceed out of the man are what defile the man. He who has ears, let him hear. Folks, our problem is not that we can't keep the rules and the regulations or that we don't keep them. Our problem is that we are incapable of keeping God's law because we are natural-born sinners. This should have not come as a surprise to these religious scholars. I mean, had they not read the Bible? Had they not read Jeremiah? Chapter 17, verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who could know it? Surely they had read Psalm 14, 1 through 3, which says that there is no one who does good, not even one. Or Ecclesiastes 7, 20, which says there is no righteous man on earth who continually does good and never sins. So what Jesus was saying should not have been a surprise to these people. They should have known what the Word of God said. But they had invalidated the Word of God to convince themselves that they were righteous when they were not. They had believed a lie for so long that it had become true in their eyes, blinded as they were. But Jesus is always about opening the eyes of blinds, man. And, and, which, and opening the eyes of the blind is a metaphor for spiritual birth because you, you remember the song, I was, once was blind, but now I see. I mean, that's, that, that, that's the reality. Before we come to Christ, we are blind to our own sin. But when he quickens our heart and opens our understanding and we begin to see ourselves as we truly are, then our eyes are opened. Our problem, our problem is internal. Our problem is not external. Our problem is not superficial. Our problem is spiritual. Deep within the heart of every human being, we are sinners. Which brings me to my observations with a view towards application. First of all, note with me that what Jesus tells us here is a diagnostic word. It's a diagnostic. The word diagnostic, of course, means to to have knowledge of something. And Jesus gives us insight. He gives us knowledge. And he tells us that we are sinners. And it's a hard truth that our world doesn't want to, to hear. And can I just be honest with you? It's a hard truth that a lot of Christians don't want to hear. A lot of people in church don't want to hear that we're sinners. If you get online and you research psychology journals and, 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 and you put in, you know, is man basically good? There are basically two positions that humanity has come up with about the nature of man. Some will say, well, man is basically good. He's born a blank slate. And it's society and it's environment that turns him into a sinner. It's like the little boy. He came home with a, a bad report card and it had F's on it. It was all F's. And his father looked at that report card and said, son, how do you explain this? And he said, I don't know, dad. Is it environmental or is it hereditary? It's certainly not my fault. It's somebody else's fault that I made a bad grade. And that's how a lot of people view sin. It's not my fault. I wasn't born a sinner. I was born a good person. In fact, in the early church, there was a heresy named Pelagianism, named after a guy named Pelagius. And Pelagius said, well, we're all born a blank slate. We're born without a sinful nature, and we learn how to sin. But that's not what Jesus says. Jesus says we're born sinners. 
There's a second way the world looks at it. The second way the world looks at it is to say, well, there, there is an equal good and bad in each person. And you see this in Eastern dualism. Maybe you've seen it in Star Wars, the good and the dark side of the force. And so in Eastern dualism, it says that everybody has a choice as to which, they'll, which side of the force they'll go to. Will you go to the light or will you go to the darkness? And you see, this is even taught in cartoons. Remember when you were watching Sylvester and Tweety Bird? And Sylvester's sitting there, and he's thinking about whether or not he should eat Tweety Bird, and there's an angel on one side and a devil on the other side. That's kind of the way a lot of people think, as if we had the choice to always choose right. But the Bible tells us we don't always have the choice to choose right, because it tells us that we are sinners. Now, there's a difference between being absolutely depraved and being totally depraved. Let me explain that. Absolute depravity means there's no ability within you at all to make a good choice. And the Bible doesn't teach that we are absolutely depraved. But the Bible does teach that we are totally depraved. That means that every part of us is in some way affected by sin. And so while we can make good choices, invariably we're also going to make bad choices. And even our good choices are often going to be influenced by that sinful nature within us. So this is a diagnostic word, right? One of the things I love about Jesus is he's just telling the truth. He's telling it like it is. He's telling us that we are sinners. And can I tell you this morning, that is part of the gospel? I hear a lot of people saying, I want to tell you the, the, the gospel. And that's Jesus has a good plan for your life and Jesus loves you. But can I tell you something, folks, this morning? If we don't know how grave our sin is, we'll never understand how great God's salvation is. The, the reality that we are sinners is part and parcel of the gospel because you can't have any good news until you understand the bad news. And this is the bad news. And, and that's why we don't hear a lot of it being preached. Because, well, it's not a safe place. We, we don't want to offend anybody. I mean, if they come to our church and we tell them they're sinners, they might not come back. It's like going to the doctor. Well, I better not tell them they're sick. They might not come back. I love the great physician Jesus. He tells it like it is. He says, you got a problem. But you see, what I also love about Jesus is when he tells us that we have a problem, he always has a solution for that problem. Because not only is this, this scripture a diagnostic word, it's a word of invitation. It's a word of invitation, but before it's a word of invitation, I want you to see something. It's a word of warning. Well, what, what are you warning me about? What are you warning me about? I'll tell you. Jesus is talking to religious leaders. He's talking to the most religious people in the entire nation. He's talking to the scholars who understand the, the, the word, who spent all of their time copying down the Scripture. They knew it inside and out. They were very well versed in scripture and he's giving them a rebuke and that rebuke serves to you and to me as a warning this idea of invalidating the word of god began in the garden of eden didn't it? i mean satan said did god really say that and it, and it's metamorphosized it's morphed into all different kinds of of of, of, of iterations and variations over the years but it manifests itself in every different culture in every different place as something new and something unique in ancient israel during the time of jesus it was keeping the traditions of men but in our day it manifests itself it's just maybe not the same in our day it manifests itself in other ways maybe it's focusing more on being culturally relevant than biblically sound on being hip rather than being holy I mean, how many churches are more concerned about being accepted by the world than being accepted by God? How many Christians would rather have a foot in both camp, you know, accepted by the world, accepted by God? Well, I got to be relevant. Listen, I don't want to be so earthly relevant that I'm heavenly irrelevant. I want to be relevant to God. I want to be relevant to His Word. And sometimes if we're not careful in our attempts to win the favor of people, we can invalidate the Word of God by preaching half of it or part of it or not the whole counsel of God's Word. Maybe you've, people, you've heard people throwing out 
portions of scripture like the wrath of God. I know a preacher one time, he said, we're not going to mention the cross. We're not going to mention blood because that's offensive to people. We're just going to talk about how God has a better plan and how God wants to be your friend. Sound familiar? Sound like having your best life now? Folks, listen, that's invalidating the word of God. The gospel tells us that we're sinners and that if we don't know that we're sinners, we won't know that we need to be saved. Maybe this invalidating the word of God manifests itself in the values that we adopt. Many well-intentioned Christians have allowed the world around them to dictate what is right and what is wrong. And rather than heeding the word of God precisely because the word of God stands in direct opposition to the spirit of the age, instead of preaching the whole counsel of the word of God, they only preach parts of it that are acceptable to the world. Or maybe it manifests itself in the inflexibility that we exercise when it comes to our cherished traditions. Yeah, I've found that sacred cows make great barbecue. Sometimes we, I was reminded of the story when I was thinking about this text about the young man who went to a church up in, in northern Wisconsin and he was, the, the, the old pastor had been there for a long time and the old pastor retired. The young pastor came in and man, he was faithful. He visited, he witnessed, he went to the hospitals, he preached the word of God faithfully. But there were just some people in the church that just didn't like him. And, and he didn't understand why. And he, he prayed with them. He loved them. He did everything he could. And, and, and they, they just they started to complain about him. And, and, and so he, he finally went to one of them. He said, I, I just don't understand. What, what am I doing? What am I not doing? Why, why do you guys have something against me? They said, well, you're just not as spiritual as our last pastor. And he said, well, what do you mean I'm not as spiritual as your last pastor? And they said, well, before every service, our last pastor would walk over to the side of the church and he would put his hands out as if he was communing with God. And you just don't do that. So we just don't think you're a spiritual. So he went to see the former pastor. He said, man, I, I've done everything I know how to do. I'm preaching, I'm praying, I'm visiting. He said, but they told me that I don't go over and touch, you know, over to the side of the church and put my hands out like you did. Can you tell me why you did that? He said, yeah, that's where the heater is, and my hands were always cold. <laughs> the traditions of men. If we're not careful, we can get so wrapped up in our traditions that we miss the point. And the point is, folks, that we're not here to perpetuate our traditions. We're not here to be accepted by the world. We're not here to be hip and cool. We are here to make a difference in the kingdom of God, to win people to Jesus Christ, to disciple people to become followers of Jesus Christ. That's what Paul said when he said, I become all things to all men that I might save some. That's what God is calling us to. And the, the religious leaders of Jesus' day had bypassed that. And they had turned it into something that was all about them. They were no longer servants of God, reaching people in the name of God. It was all about them. That's why Jesus says, he who has an ear, let him hear. The warning here is we need to be more concerned with what God knows about us than what others think about us. We don't need to major on the minors and minor on the majors. We need to be careful to preach all of God's word because only God's word and only the true gospel has the power to transform lives. But there's a third thing, and I mentioned it just a minute ago because it's so important. And that is that it's, it's an invitation. You see, Jesus never presents us with a problem that he doesn't also give us a solution. And when Jesus says that the, the real problem that you have is your heart, he's talking to you, he's talking to me, he's talking to each one of us. Every one of us has a heart that needs to be changed. That's why Jesus said, you must be born again. You need a new life. You need a new being. You know, that's why the scripture says, if any man's in Christ, he's a new creation. All things are passed away. All things have become new. We can't we can't go through the religious rituals and transform ourselves. Jesus told Nicodemus, the most religious person he could find, you must be born again. And so don't, don't miss this. Jesus is telling the people and he's telling his disciples, listen, don't listen to these scribes and Pharisees. They don't know what they're talking about. It's not what you eat that defiles you. The defilement is deep within you. It comes from your heart. And when Jesus himself is saying that, don't miss this. Every verse is interpreted, each verse is interpreted in the light of every verse. Jesus is saying this, and he himself is the solution to our problem. When the angel visited 
Joseph to tell him that Mary was pregnant with the Son of God. He said, and you shall name him Yeshua. You shall name him Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Folks, I want you to know we can have all kinds of good programs. We can have all kinds of great ministries, and and, and we can do a lot of things. But only Jesus can save people. That's why Peter, when he was preaching, said, there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Only the name of Jesus. There's only power in the name of Jesus. We're here to preach Jesus. And when we preach Jesus, we have to preach the whole counsel of God's Word. We can't throw out the parts that are culturally insensitive. We need to be on guard against allowing anything to take away from the truth of God's Word, sometimes harsh truth, sometimes brutal truth, sometimes an inconvenient truth, but nonetheless the truth of of, of God's Word. And So it's an invitation that whosoever will may come. You know, I, I know some people who don't give invitations. I know some people who say, well, you know, God's going to save who He's going to save. And I I don't want to offer an invitation because if I do and somebody is emotionally charged and they come and they make a decision, they might not really be saved. So I'm not going to offer the invitation. Well, that's a problem for me because Jesus is always offering invitations. The Bible says, God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Jesus wants to see people saved. He, He came to seek and to save the lost. So not only is this an invitation for people to come and to give their life and their heart to Jesus and to know the forgiveness that he can give and to know the new life that he can give, but it's a call to action. So there's an invitation here for the lost person who's never come to know Jesus to surrender their life to Jesus, to experience forgiveness, like the old song says, burdens are lifted at Calvary, to to set that burden aside and to have a new life. That's the invitation, but there's also a call to action. Because you see, once we've accepted the the invitation and we've accepted Jesus Christ, then he calls us to get busy in his kingdom's work. God's calling us to be busy about the business of telling people about Jesus. That's our job. I, I, I get tired of watching the news. Are you tired of watching the news? I'm just weary of it, you know. And every time you turn a station on, I mean, it's COVID this, COVID. I think the 19 stands for the number of pounds you're going to gain during this time. I don't know. It's just everything's about the COVID-19 thing. And I'm like, I'm sick of it. But just it got me thinking. I mean, imagine for a moment that you, uh, you know, you're, you're sitting around, you're bored, you get online, you start researching, and, and you follow one trail after another trail, and pretty soon it just kind of comes into focus and you have found the cure for COVID-19. And you double check and you look and it's, it's something that's very simple. It's something that everybody has access to and you found it and you don't know what to do with it. You're like, I found the cure. And you check your work and you double check your work and sure enough, you got the cure that could save untold lives. What do you do with it? Well, some would want to monetize it. I'm going to try to sell this to Big Pharma and make my money. Others would be afraid. They would say, well, I can't put this out online because everybody will think I'm a quack and Big Pharma will put it down because they can't make money on it. You know, all those kinds of thoughts would go along. But I think most people would want to share it. I think most people would say, how do I get the word out? How do I tell people about this simple solution to a terrible problem? I think I'll just start by telling people one-on-one. I think I'll use every means and every avenue available to me to broadcast this. I'm going to tell people how they can beat this. Folks, listen to me. You you understand the analogy, don't you? Uh, COVID can take its hundreds of thousands, but listen to me. Sin has taken its hundreds of millions. And COVID, Jesus says, don't be afraid of the one that can kill your body. Be afraid of the one that can put your soul in hell. There's a great problem that we are facing in America today, and I'm not talking about COVID. I'm talking about sin that's sending men and women, boys and girls, to eternity in separation from God. And we, the people of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have been entrusted with the answer. He says, therefore, you are ambassadors for Christ. 
You are ambassadors. We, he has given us the ministry of reconciliation, and we go and we plead with people, be reconciled to God. That is our job. That is why we as Christians have been called. That is why we as the church exist, so that we can be about the mission, the, the, the business of making disciples for Jesus Christ. I believe with all of my heart that God will bless the church. He'll bless the Christian who focuses on winning people and discipling people. We say, Pastor, there's a lot of good ministries. We could go feed the homeless or feed the hungry and, 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 and shelter the homeless, and we should. We should be about social ministry. But I can show you a lot of community food banks that aren't Christian. I can show you a lot of homeless shelters that aren't Christians. Or we should educate and, and, and teach English to people. You know, we ought to educate people. Well, you can, you can educate them, and they'll just go to hell educated if they don't know Jesus. But who, if we do not share the gospel, who's going to share the gospel? If we don't take the message of Jesus Christ and we don't boldly proclaim it, who's going to do that? The news media is not going to do it. The government's not going to do it. That's our job. That is uniquely commissioned to the people of God and empowered by the Spirit of God. God will bless that if we are faithful to do it. And that's our call to mission. And so here's the conclusion, folks. How does this word hit you this morning? I know how it hits me. And that's the hard thing about being a preacher is you can't preach something. It can't go through you until it goes to you. You know, it, you study these things and it beats you up first. I mean, how does it hit you this morning? Do you agree with the diagnostic analysis of Scripture that we're all sinners in need of salvation and that only Jesus can save? Or have we bought into a ritualistic, man-centered approach to our problem? Have you ever given your heart and your life to Jesus? Maybe you're watching on television. You're watching on the Internet. And you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Maybe you've gone to church. But I tell people, look, you can go to church, but that's not going to make you a Christian any more than going to a garage is going to make you a car. Jesus said, you must be born again. And so here's my offer to you this morning. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, today is the day of salvation. Now is the time to give your heart and your life to Jesus. Today, you can be born again. Maybe you're a Christian here, and you're a follower of Jesus Christ, but you're not really focused on winning people to Jesus. You've allowed yourself to get distracted by other things. And this morning, God is calling you back. He's saying, listen, I will bless whatever I have commanded you to do. And if you will be faithful to do what I've called you to do, I will bless it. You'll see. Let's pray together this morning. Father, I pray this morning if there's one person who's heard this message, who's never accepted you as their Lord and Savior, that today would be the day of their salvation. They would recognize that there are things that can kill the body, but oh, how much more deadly are that, those things that can kill the soul. And sin separates us from you. And Lord, we need to be saved. And that's why Jesus went to the cross and shed his blood and gave his life for us so that we, by putting our faith in him, could be delivered from the penalty of sin and have new life. And so if there's one here listening this morning, Lord, who has never accepted you and had the forgiveness of sins today, you would give them, Lord, that, that, that sense of calling, that sense of invitation. You would draw them to yourself, and they would give their heart and their life to you. Maybe there are Christians here this morning, Lord, who've gotten distracted by lesser things. And this morning, you're calling them back to the most important things, to be on mission with you to remember why you saved them and, and why you've gifted them and why you've blessed them so that they can expand your kingdom and make your kingdom the greatest thing in their life. And Father, I pray this morning that we would have ears to hear in Jesus' name. Stand with me this morning. This is our time of response. God's spoken to you this morning. There'll be a pastor, someone here at the front to meet with you. If you're watching online this morning, I want you to go ahead and, 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 and connect with us. Maybe you're here this morning and, or you're watching and you're saying, you know, I, I need a church home. I don't know where 
I, I plug in. I don't know how to plug in. Listen, there's no better place than Kirby Woods Baptist Church right here. This is a place where you'll find love. You'll find people who are committed to the Lord Jesus Christ, committed to his work, and committed to seeing you grow in your walk with God. As we sing, you come.